One of the questions that you guys have submitted that I, that I love is, it's simple, Mars, how can we help? In the short term, Mars is really about getting the spaceship built, uh, that, ship, that, that ship right now. I, I think right now that like, the, the biggest thing that would be helpful is um, just general support and encouragement. Now, once, once that has been built and there is a, uh, there's a means of getting cargo and people to and from Mars, as well as to and from the moon, um, and, and other places in the solar system, then I think uh, that, that, that's really where th there's a tremendous amount of uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial resources that are needed. Because you've got to build out the entire base of industry, everything that allows hu uh, human civilization to exist. And anyone who, for the early people that go to, go to Mars, it'll be far more dangerous. I mean, really, it's, it, it kind of reads like Shackleton's ad for Antarctic explorers. You know, it's like, um, difficult, dangerous, good chance you'll die. And, and they will start off building the most elementary infrastructure, just a base uh, to create propellant, uh, uh, a power station glass domes in which to grow crops, um, all the, the sort of fundamentals um, without which we, you cannot survive. I think Mars should really have great bars, you know, <laughs> um, the Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'll be able, to, be able to do short flights, short sort of up and down flights, um, probably sometime in the first half of next year. What, what's amazing about the ship, assuming we can make um, full and and rapid reusability work is that we can reduce the cost, marginal cost per flight dramatically um, by orders of magnitude compared to where it is today. A BFR flight will actually cost less uh, than, than our Falcon 1 flight did back in the day. Wow. Um, so that was about a five or six million dollar marginal cost per flight. We we're confident that BFR will be less than that. And that is what will enable the creation of a, uh, a permanent base on the moon and a city on Mars. Well, at, at SpaceX, almost all my time is spent on um, engineering and design. Um, it's probably 80 and 90%. Um, and then uh, Gwyn Chotwell, who's president and chief operating officer, takes care of the business operations of the company, um, which is what allows me to do that. Um, and um, yeah, I think in, in order to make the right decisions, you have to understand something. And if you don't understand something at a detailed level, you cannot make a decision. Well, in the case of SpaceX, uh, I just kept wondering why we were not making progress towards um, sending people to Mars, um, why we didn't have a base on the moon, um, you know, where, where are the sort of space hotels that were promised in 2001 in the movie? Uh, it's like, you know, it's, uh, it just wasn't happening year after year. And as I got more and more into what it would take to do that, I learned that the fundamental um, issue is actually the cost of access to space. Rockets were super expensive and the cost, cost per pound or kilogram to orbit had actually gone up over the years, not down. And it was like, okay, well, if, it, it, it won't matter if, if, if we are able to do this philanthropic mission and um, it generates a lot of will to go to Mars, that's not going to matter if there's no way. Um, I started reading a lot of books on rockets and did a, sort of a first principles analysis of, of a rocket, just broke down the materials that are in a rocket, what would it cost to buy those materials, what versus the price of the rocket, and there's a gigantic difference between the um, raw material cost of the rocket and the finished cost of the rocket. How do, you, think, how, do you, how do you plan a business where you know, the rocket business, you know some of these things are going to blow up on the launch pad? How, how, did, how does the business plan work? I don't really have a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> for business time, almost all of it is really dedicated to SpaceX and Tesla. It may sound like I've got a lot of different endeavors, but it's overwhelmingly SpaceX and Tesla in terms of time allocation. In fact, the only uh, public security that I own of any kind is Tesla. Um, and then the, the next biggest is, is SpaceX. And, um, and then uh, the Boring Company kind of started it more as a joke, because that would be a funny name for a company. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we put, uh, we put the zero in bring. I mean, it's sort of like... Um, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. 
Um, <laughs> I'm really quite close to, I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI, and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. Um, you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole, 4-5, um, who had been world champion for many years, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was Alpha Zero, uh, which crushed Alpha Go, 100 to zero. <laughs> And Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you whatever rules you give it, it, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman. I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200 percent um, safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking like maybe 18 months from now. Um, so the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face and the, and the most pressing one. I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think it, one should generally err on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. If you know that there's, a, there's likely to be, we don't know, but there's likely to be another dark ages, which it seems, my guess is there probably will be at some point. Um, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that we're about to enter dark ages, but that there's some probability that we will, particularly if there's a third world war. Um, then we want to make sure that there's enough of a, of a seed of human civilization somewhere else uh, to bring civilization back. But I think sustainable energy is also obviously really important. It's tautological. If it's not sustainable, it's unsustainable. Yeah, how close are we to solving that problem? Well, I think that the core technologies are, are there with the wind, solar, um, with, with batteries. Um, the, the fundamental problem is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of, of, of CO2. Um, the, the, the market economics works very well if things are priced correctly. But when, there's, when things are not priced correctly, um, and something that has, has a real cost has zero cost, then that's where you get distortions in the market that inhibit the progress of, of other technologies. So, um, essentially, anything that that produces carbon, it will push, push carbon into the atmosphere, which includes rockets, by the way. So I'm not excluding rockets from this. Um, there has to be a price, and that um, you can start off with a low price, uh, but then that price, and, and then depending upon whether that price has any effect on the parts per million, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, you can adjust that price up or down. Uh, but in the absence of a price. We sort of pretend that digging trillions of tons of of, of uh, fossil fuels from deep un under the earth and putting it into the atmosphere, we're pretending that that, ha that 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 has no probability of a bad outcome. We don't talk that much about Starlink, but essentially it's intended to provide low latency, high bandwidth internet connectivity throughout the world. Um, that there actually will not be enough cognitive processing power on board the satellite system to, to uh, in any way be a Skynet thing. Like it's the, I think most likely the, the form of government on Mars would be somewhat of a direct democracy where um, 
you vote on issues, where, where people vote directly on issues, instead of going through representative government. In, in, you know, when the United States was formed, representative government was the only thing that was logistically feasible. Because people, there's no way, it was no way for people to communicate instantly. Um, a lot of people didn't even have really access to uh, mailboxes, or there wasn't even really a, the post office was very, very, very primitive. A lot of people couldn't write. Um, so you had to have some form of representative democracy, uh, or things just wouldn't work at all. Um, but I think on Mars, most likely it's going to be people, everyone votes on every issue, and that's how it goes. There are a few things I'd recommend, which is keep laws short. Um, long laws, it's like that's, that's something suspicious is going on if there's long laws.